thank you uh, again for joining us in the fourth uh, lecture in a series on mathematical biology. Uh, uh, and uh, thank you very, very much for Professor Coudier to, for being with us today. It is uh, my honor to introduce you. Uh, so Professor Coudier received an engineering diploma in aeronautics in 1994, a PhD from University of Toulouse. Uh, he has been an assistant professor at the University of Nantes until 2012, and he currently holds a full professor position at the University of Bordeaux, where he leads the Enria Carmen team with the Electrophysiology and Heart Modeling Institute within the Electrophysiology and Heart Modeling Institute Lyric. His main research interests are numerical methods, scientific computing, and computational cardiac electrophysiology. He is in particular interested in the analytics of, uh, in the analysis of the finite volume discretization methods uh, of cardiac models and their applications to computational simulation studies of cardiac arrhythmias. Uh, uh, Professor Coudier, uh, the floor is yours. Yes, fine. Thank you. It was a, a nice introduction. Thank you. Uh, so you told everything. So today I will. I had to make difficult choices because uh, when I prepared the the summary and the title, I decided to to give you a kind of overview of uh, uh, models that we use in in cardiac computations, but but then it means that I will. Uh, just pass over many subjects, and I will not enter any details of, of any of these subjects, except maybe one, but just not so many details. Um, so I, I, I will give some a, a bit of context at the beginning, uh, explain to you what is modeling for cardiac arrhythmias, and, and give you some uh, some examples of applications that we that 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 we could uh, go through the past years in Bordeaux, and then this is where maybe if I have time I will enter a bit of details on some numerical methods and conclusions. So the subject is cardiac arrhythmias. This is to say it's a it's a subject of major importance. So these are statistics in Europe, but they, you can. Imagine how it is like worldwide. Uh, so basically, the the heart is a pump that you know it pumps the blood into the body, and in order to pump correctly the blood into the body, uh, uh, it has to 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 contract uh, regularly and to contrast to contract in a synchronous manner uh, at at uh, several levels. So the the four chambers of the heart. Have to synchronize in some way, but each chamber is a is a network of cells, and the cells have to be synchronized so that they contract all together at the same time. And this synchronization is is due to a, an electrical wave that that uh, passes through the tissue uh, and makes it makes uh, the synchronization. So arrhythmias are events in which this uh, nice synch electrical synchronization uh, is perturbed. And there are many types of arrhythmias, but they are all of, of, of major importance. So if they are at the level of at atria, uh, uh, they are not, uh, you can live with such an event, an atrial fibrillation or an atrial arrhythmia in general, but they are a major cause of stroke. And, and, and uh, so they are a huge burden for the healthcare systems because it costs a lot, of, a lot of money to understand these pathologies and to treat the people who have atrial arrhythmia. But if they occur in, in the ventricles, then, then they lead to what we call sudden cardiac death. And so this is obviously uh, very important also. And this is basically what I'm trying to understand. So what I want what I do, the science that I'm interested in, is to understand the mechanisms that are behind this uh, arrhythmias. And after understand these mechanisms using uh, applied mathematics, so it means uh, modeling and uh, computer simulations. 
So in details, I do that in an institute called uh, Lyric. So it, it means Institute for uh, Cardiac Rhythm and, and Cardiac Modeling. And it's a very nice place because it's a place where that combines on the same location various uh, disciplines. So it's a, it's a way for people, it's a place where people from different disciplines can, can talk to each other and build projects all together. So that's a, that's a good way to, uh, to, to be into the application of, of, of mathematics, for instance. Uh, there is a website, you, you can go to see the website if you want. And we have very nice colleagues with very, very fancy experimental setups. And we can, we can discuss with all, all of them. And there is a huge imaging platform, which is very useful also. And then in this institute, there is this Carmen team uh, that was uh, uh, named in the introduction. So it's a team, it's the team of applied mathematicians to summarize that work into the Lyric uh, in order to understand these uh, arrhythmias. And uh, the team has three main axes of, of research. One is, is about mathematical formulation or uh, uh, numerical analysis results that, that we can find on, on models used to understand cardiac arrhythmias or yes, cardiac arrhythmias. So it's, building models using uh, in sometimes high performance computing and looking at uh, high convergence results, these, these things that probably you know about. And then uh, we have an axis on how these models can help to understand specific pathologies. So this is something we don't do on our own, but in collaborations with biologists or with, with cardiologists. And then there is a third axis on inverse problems uh, which aims at um, uh, understanding uh, the, the information that is hidden into the electrical signals that we can record on the body surface of a patient or in experimental setups, uh, various electrical or optical signals that uh, uh, measures the electrical activity of the heart. So I, I won't talk about these uh, inverse problems, but only on, on the direct models and the, the mathematics that we that we can do with them and how they how they are uh, set up in terms of math. Hmm. So this is how it works. <clears throat> uh, more in details, there is a very local impulsion. So each each cardiac cell has a membrane which separates the an intracellular domain from an extracellular one and and there are uh, mechanisms, molecular mechanisms, that makes ion go through the membrane in, in one di direction or the other. And this results in a, in, a, in a voltage, an electrical voltage, that exists between the intracellular and extracellular domains. And this, this voltage can, can change sign spontaneously in the sinus node here, the yellow curve here. And then once, once it changes node, it, it propagates from one cell to the other. And then each cell in its turn will have its potential change sign and then come back to rest. So this, this shape is called the action potential and it propagates from cell to cell, starting from the sinus node down to the, to, to, to the ventricles. And this is what we try to model and to understand. So it's a localized impulsion at the, at the scale of a, of a single cell. It propagates through a network of cells. So the, the, the arrangement in space of the cells and also the, their, uh, elec their individual electrical functions uh, organizes this propagation from the, the small scale, one cell, to the global scale, the scale of the, the complete organ, for instance. Uh, at which it provides synchronization. So here, synchronization means uh, between between the start of the signal at the sinus node and the moment where it uh, gains the whole ventricles, there are something like 100 milliseconds, and 100 milliseconds is small enough 
uh, with respect to the mechanical system to consider that it's synchronized. Okay, so uh, I have a, a movie just to show you. I don't know if it's going to be very illustrative, but we'll see. So on this one, this is a, a model of a cardiac ventricle. So two ventricles, you see the left and right ventricles, the aorta here. Okay, and so in, in, the, in the model, we just stimulate the heart, so start the action potential on this, this uh, gray point. So there is a wave front that propagates. So in blue, the, the voltage is at rest, and in red, it's, the cells are excited. So the, this is the excitement part of the action potential. And when you look at, on the body surface, then you can also measure these electrical potentials. And if you measure them at the gray dots here, uh, then you get the uh, electrocardiograms that probably all of you have heard of. And so the, there are many scales, the scale of the cell, the scale of the, the a tissue, for instance, one ventricle or two ventricles or the complete heart with the four chambers, and then, and then the body itself. Uh, and this makes it quite complex to understand how the, the voltage and the body can uh, uh, represents what, what, ha what is happening in the heart. And then I have another small movie. That's the one in which instead you see the very small scale. So this is a, 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 about 100 of cardiac cells that have been meshed. So the cell surface, let's say, external surface of the cell have, have been meshed. And here we are just navigating into the cells Oops, sorry. Uh, and you can see that it's a very complex network. There is inside the cell, you can go, you go outside. So it, it's like that. And what we want to do is understand how this complex network of cells give, give rise to a signal that is organized at the macroscopic level and synchronizes the whole heart. That's it. So, yes, now I have a question because I don't really know who is the, the public. So I suggest this question. So you go to this website or you can, you can go by, by flashing the QR code and there will be a question. So I have to activate it. So that's the way, the way. So if everybody is okay, I start the question. Let's go. So question is, do you, do you know or have you ever heard of, of, of these equations or, or model or method? So you click on one of them or several of them. If you know everything, then you click everything. And we should see the stat here, hopefully. Uh, can Does you it work? Try to go back to the, yes, to the code. To the link. Yeah. So if it, it, there is the QR code, but if it's, it's the, link, the link is easy to remember. It's the booklap.com slash camps. I made, it, I made it personal. Tell me when I can go to the question. The movie starts again. It's okay. I'm not sure about the audience. <laughs> <laughs> we can go Let's to go. the question. Let's go. Just to answer yes. the question. Do you know uh, what is the monodomain equation, the bidomain equation, the Hodgkin Huxley model, the Roche Larson method? Right now, one person knows everything. So over two, you can see. Ah, so I can see that 11 persons joined the, the pool. 
and these are the answers. So we need a few answers before we go on. I don't know why this. Let me stop the video. I think that's it. Okay. We have 14 answers. Okay, so let's let's say this is, this is Nice. So it says that uh, almost everyone knows the monodomain equations, but not so many knows about the bidomain or the Hodgkin Huxley, and only a few persons know the knows the Rochdarsen method. But that's not unexpected. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, I I'll, uh, I didn't know, so I I will explain the bi what are the bidomain equations, the Hodgkin Huxley model, the monodomain equations, and then the Rochdarsen method, and and at the end we'll see. Okay. Let's go back. So Hodgkin Huxley, so that's the that's the Hodgkin and Huxley are the persons who first wrote a model of uh, what happens in the in the cells when when they depolarize. So the phenomena with the, the voltage that's changed sign. Uh, they won a Nobel Prize for that. So it's and and they invented or they used a technique that is called patch clamp that consists in looking at the membrane of the cell in details and measuring electrical currents uh, between the intracellular and extracellular uh, uh, parts or domains. And then they, they could, in, in some sense, observe the ions, individual ions passing through the membranes. They identified, they identified mechanisms that make ions go from the inside to the outside or outside to inside. Uh, and they invented a, a notion of gating variables, meaning that, okay, the membrane is permeable to some ions, but the, this permeability uh, depends, it is variable, and it's variable between, between zero and a maximum, and this, this level of permeability between, so it's a number between zero and one, zero or hundred percent of the maximum is the gating variable. So they invented these gating variables and they, they wrote some equations for ion currents that are currents going flowing through this, this uh, pores here and uh, lots of kind of currents. So some of them are just pores. So the, when, when you open a pore in a membrane, then the ion flows uh, following the electrochemical gradients. So there are equations like that in, in, the, in the Hodgkin Huxley model. So this is an Ernst equilibrium potential of species X. Uh, and there are other times, types of currents because you need the cell to get back to its resting uh, potential. So you need also not only to go along the electrochemical gradient, but to, to go against it also. So there are pumps and exchangers, all kind of, of, of such uh, uh, currents and on a, on a more modern uh, model, so this is one from Luo Rudy from the 90s. It, it is a schematic of a cell, cardiac cell membrane model. So the Hodgkin Huxley worked on, a, on, a, on an axon. Uh, so the, the, their model was not for specifically for cardiac cells, but it was adapted after for cardiac cells. Uh, so it becomes quite complex. Each of these uh, small uh, arrow means a current, and in ev even more complex, we can consider intracellular uh, compartment and, and fluxes uh, of some ions, typically calcium, between these intracellular compartments and, uh, and, uh, and the intracellular space. Uh, in general. So, in terms of math, 
it writes like that. This is the way I, I write it. Uh, it's a personal way, but I, I believe that it's quite useful. So in a model, you have uh, a certain number of state variables, which are V is the voltage, so it's a scalar variable. W are a, a series of gating variables, so there are numbers between 0 and 1. And you have number of gates of such variables. And X is all the rest, all what you cannot, all what is not a transform brain voltage and what is not a gating variables. So uh, usually it's ion concentrations or it's the internal flux between the, the intracellular compartments. And what is nice in the Hodgkin Huxley uh, formalism is that the gating variables, they, they follow. Uh, semi-linear uh, differential equations like that. So uh, it's linear with respect to the gate W number K, but th the, the limit and the time scale, so this is a limit and the tau is a time scale, they, they are non-linear. Then the remainder variables, the X, so this should be a X, sorry for the typo, follow some non-linear evolution equations with not very specific. And then the ion currents is, is the, this J here. So the ion currents is the, the I here, but usually it's renormalized by a capacitance because the membrane is assumed to, to behave like a capacity. And when you rescale that, you, I call it J ion. And this is in general a function of all the variables, the state variables, but it writes as a sum of currents. So this is the sum of the individual currents. Is each of the ij is one of the, the arrows that you saw on the previous uh, picture. And for instance, if you consider a current that is uh, uh, one that goes, follows the, the electrochemical gradients, it, it looks like that. You have a maximal conductance, j here. You have the, the the difference between the transmembrane voltage and the Nernst equilibrium. And, and then you multiply by some gating variables. That's, that's the modeling part. So you say that this, this, this ion current depends on three gates. So there are three molecular systems that makes the pore open or close. Uh, and they appear like that in the model. So this is the Hodg hodgkin oakley likes models. They are used uh, widely uh, to, to understand uh, cellular electrophysiology in general, uh, and specifically for cardiac cells. So if you want to look, to have a look at one that we use, it's the, so CRN is, is, is the name of the author, it's Courtemanche, Ramirez, Natel. So it looks like that. It's not a very complex one with not so many currents and not so many unknowns, but anyway, you, if you want to write all the equations on one slide, it looks like that. So just to show that in practice, so in math you can write it simply, but in practice when you want to really use them or study it, it's, it's, it's a bit complex, but you need that. So these models, they follow the hodgkin Huxley formalisms. You can find uh, many of them on a database online, which is the CellML database. Uh, the ones that are used in, in, in cardiac applications are, the, are these models. So BR is the Biller Reuter uh, from 1977. It's the first uh, model that was right for ventricular ac action potentials of a mammal. Then the CRN, the one we saw on the previous slide uh, from uh, 98, is a model dedicated to action potentials in the atria, in human atria. Then we have this TNNP from 2004 is dedicated to uh, uh, action potential in human ventricular cells. So the, this one is, is for human. The TP, uh, so that's 10, 10 to share from Philof, uh, 2006 is a simplification on this one. And another example is the Ayer, Mazari, and Winslow from 2007, I think. Uh, it's also for human ventricular uh, ca cardiomyocytes, so cardiac cells. Uh, and so the last three are for human cardiac ventricular cells, but they have different objectives. The TP06 is the simplest, the simpler one of the three. The TNNP is the first one uh, written, so 
it's, it's the one from which the TP06 is derived. And this higher Masary Winslow is a very complex one that can be used to study very complex phenomena related to drug, for instance. Uh, and if you want numbers, the, the TNNP it has like 14 currents. So a total of maybe 20 or 30 equations, ordinary differential equations. And as a comparison, the IR Masary Winslow has about the same number of currents, but the number of state variables, gating variables used to describe these currents are, are in a much more uh, high number. And, and so there is a total of about 100 equations in this model. So when you want to, to do analysis, sometimes you use simpler model. So the, there are two variables model that are mimicking the basic properties of these ionics models. So this one is, a, is, is these are examples. So the, the mitchell Schaeffer is widely used currently, but uh, by before it was the alief panfilov so it depends on, on it depends. Uh, but uh, if you, uh, for the one that are more involved in to math, these, these, these models, all of them, this uh, Aliyev Panfilov, Mitchell Schaeffer, Fenton Karma, Bueno Rovio, etc., they all have a behavior that is like a P stable equation in, in the first variable, this U here. Just to, to give a simple characterization. Okay, now the bidomain equation. So, uh, Hodgkin Huxley in their paper, that's from 1951, so it's an old work. They derived this first uh, model of action potential uh, of, a, of, a, of an axon, but an axon is also a, a very long cell. So, it's a nerve cell, it's, a, it's a, the long part of the nerve cell. Uh, and and so the action potential propagates along this axon. So they all see, they also wrote a first model for the propagation of the action potential along the axon. And they, they used uh, the cable theory, so a cable equation coupled to the ionic model. And this was afterwards, it was generalized. So it's, it's a 1D model because the axon can be seen as a 1D domain in which an action potential propagates. But the heart is a more complex 3D uh, network of cells that are really, they are, they are packed very tightly together. They form like muscle bundles. So they are very, very tightly packed in, in together and they, they don't, do not resemble uh, neurons uh, at all. Um, and so it was generalized to 3D, but by just generalizing, so the the cable equation coupled to ionic models, it, it gives you a, a reaction diffusion equation uh, coupled to ODEs uh, in which in reaction diffusion equation with a bistable uh, reaction terms, you have waves that propagate. So that's a good model for propagating waves in a complex media. And this is what was used in 3D, generalized in 3D, it, it works. And in the 70s, there has been this PhD thesis of uh, Leslie Tung. So this is a, an extraction of the PhD thesis. Uh, and this, this person introduced the bi-domain equations because the monodomain was not enough to describe the, the complete activation of the heart. And in particular, to, in the monodomain model, we'll see afterwards what it looks like. You directly, you are interested in the voltage, like Hodgkin Huxley. You, just want to know the voltage, but you don't have access to intracellular and extracellular uh, domains on their own. So he wrote another system of equation in which you, in which the unknown, the main unknown is not the voltage. The voltage is still here, the V here, but the main, the main unknown are electrical fields. So the UI and UE, intracellular electrical field and extracellular electrical field. In a, in a domain that may be quite complex like that. And with, with arguments for, from physics, he proposed to write these equations, meaning that, well, this is a Laplace equation in the intracellular part and the Laplace equation in the extracellular part, but 
anisotropic. So it's not really a Laplace equation, it's uh, anisotropic diffusion, in which the source term is exactly the, the current that you that comes from the Hodgkin Huxley models. And the current that flows out of the intracellular uh, domain flows in the extracellular one. So there is a balance of, of uh, overall a balance of, of charge and, and, and charge is conserved. So this is a plus and a minus, but the, the source term is the same otherwise. And you can, if the cardiac domain is inside a bath, like that the heart is inside the torso, which is a passive media outside the heart, then you can extend the extracellular potential field into the a more general extracellular and extracardiac field uh, in which there is a source of current in, in the heart, but there is no source, it's passive in the, in the remainder domain. So these, these are the bi-domain equations. Uh, and one important parameter is this AN here, and it was introduced really by Tung in a formalized way. Uh, and he called it the total crinkled membrane surface area per unit volume of tissue. Uh, crinkled because the, we, we are used to model cells are, are like um, cardiac cells, like uh, tubes, small tubes. But in fact, the membrane has, is, is entering into, into the inside quite deeply into uh, structures that, I, that are called T-tubules. So the, the membrane forms some tubes that goes inside the, inside the cell. So there is much more cell membranes that, than surface of the, of the cylinder that we draw. And this, this parameter is very important and it's supposed to be large, meaning that the, the total surface of membrane area per unit volume is a large parameter. That's it. So overall, if you want to solve the if you want to solve some equations that would model the propagation of an action potential and this synchronization of a, of a tissue into a torso, you have a, a domain, the torso domain, that's the ellipse into which you have a heart, that's the cardiac domain, H. And then the torso domain may be inhomogeneous. You can have the lungs here, for instance, which doesn't have the same conduct electrical conductivity as the rest of the tissue the lungs or the, the bones or the, the skin. You solve these PDEs and they are coupled by the ionic current here to the ODEs from the Hodgkin-Huxley models here. So this is a reaction diffusion system of equation. So the reaction terms are here, the J ions. These are the diffusion terms. It's, it's a system. There are two equations and it's, it's a bit uh, strange because the unknown in the time derivative is V and V is UE minus UI minus UE, which are the unknowns, the individual unknowns appearing here. Uh, so it makes it degenerate and a bit difficult to study, but but uh, it's quite well known now. So that's the bi-domain equation. So I told you it's anisotropic. So overall, this is pictures of, of a very small sample of a cardiac tissue. And you can see there is an anisotropic structure in it. So there are, mm, the muscle is organized into fibers. And in the equation, it's reflected by anisotropic diffusion tensors in the, in the diffusion terms. So the anisotropy is not strong. The ratio is like one to 10, but uh, it's varying. You see these, these fibers, they turn a lot into the, in, in, in the, in the heart. So it's, it's really depending on the, on the location. So it's not strongly anisotropic, but it's varying. That's it. Uh, Okay, let's go fast because I took some time at the beginning. So if you, if you, there is a, the, you obtain the monodomain equation by um, assuming that the anisotropy ratio is the same in the intracellular and the extracellular spaces. So it means that these two tensors are proportional with lambda a real number, fixed real number, 
And then everything simplifies. You get, there is a relation between the, the, the two uh, electrical fields that is just a linear, linear dependence. And you can write the V as a function of the UE or the UE as a function of the V explicitly. And you end up with a very standard reaction diffusion equation, just a simple equation. This is the monodomain equation. And in this one, if you assume this equal anisotropy ratio, the equivalent uh, uh, diffusion coefficients that appear here is just the harmonic average of the two extracellular and intracellular coefficients that you had at the beginning. So you can still solve you can extend a bit this monodomain equation. You, uh, for instance, you can solve this equation to get the extracellular potential, which is important in many applications because when you put some electrode on the, on the torso or on the, on the tissue, what you measure is the extracellular potential, not the voltage. The voltage is not, it's not possible to measure the voltage unless you, you do some patch clamp experiment on a single cell. So on, on a tissue, you cannot. And then you can also assume that the pre previous equation, the monodomain equation, is also the one you want to solve, even if the, the, even if the equal anisotropy ratio assumption is not true. You can choose to solve the monodomain equation. It's been proved to be a very good approximation of the monodomain equation. So, it, I mean, in practice, equal anisotropy ratio is not true. But anyway, solving the monodomain equation with the harmonic average of the coefficients is anyway a very good approximation of the bidomain equations. So this is what we usually do. And then we get back to the extracellular potential by solving the, uh, an elliptic problem like that, which does not simplify into this one, into the, the one with lambda in general. Anyway, uh, in theory, it's not if it's not comp it compatible with the transmission condition between the heart and the torso. So in theory, the monodomain equation is, is, is not the bidomain equation if you don't have equal anisotropy ratio. But in practice, the, the, solution, the numerical solutions are very close. So in addition, if you want to build a complete model, then you need to go a, a bit more into application and to, to discuss with biologists and, and cardiologists to, and to enrich your model with, with what they know and with, with things you see in the literature. So this is an, an, an example of a natural geometry. So you can get such a geometry just if you work with, with, a, with a radiologist that, that helps you to segment the, the image. And then you also need to know a lot of details on the anatomy of the atria and so on. Uh, so I had another small question here, but I will pass. Uh, so the question, so the message is that we can we can go to work with with cardiologists with such models, but there is a huge effort to make because we need to 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 really enter the, the domain of cardiology and to know a lot of details on the anatomy and the function of, here it's the, atri the, the atria, but it, it's the, the heart in general, in fact. Uh, so for instance, you, you need to know all these anatomical regions in the atria, which is a very complex uh, thing. Okay. So other examples of application, once you have a model complete, what did we do? Uh, Long ago, still in Nantes, we studied so the effect of some genetic mutations uh, in, in a sudden cardiac death syndrome uh, with, with some, some colleagues in biology and, and some cardiologists. Uh, more recently, we, we used such models in very applied, these are very applied results, huh? um, to, to characterize some new drugs that are studied using some, the MEA is microelectrode array, so some kind of measures on a culture of, uh, this, is, this means human induced pluripotent stem cells, so that's, that's cell cultures of uh, kind of uh, stem cells mimicking human uh, cardiomyocytes. Uh, then you, we use such models in, in inverse problems, or like data simulation uh, problems from carto electroanatomical maps for the ones who knows what, what it means. 
And right now I'm, I'm working on pacemaker uh, within a European project. So we, we, we complete the bi-domain equations with the model of, of the pacemaker and uh, try to compute electrical potential from that. Uh, so what time is it now? So from a mathematical point of view, there are lots of questions. So, so existence, it's been mainly answered. So the, the, the references are only personal references, but there are many more on existence results. But there are still some open questions. If people are interested, we just keep the question for the end. On unicity, on bonds, on, on general ionic models. There are lots of homogenization problems behind that because the bidomain equations has been understood like 20 years after they were first written as a as the result of the homogenization problems. A question on how to compare monodomain and bidomain solutions. Uh, what is the best formulation to compute ECGs? Uh, related models like uh, gap junctions, which are uh, connections between cells or, or uh, some organites that are inside the cells like mitochondria, uh, econal equations, dipole layer formulations, uh, lots of math questions also when you want to go to a, a, a real applicative computational models like how do you set the fiber directions on a, on a ventricular anatomy or a material anatomy? How do you register mesh on one, from one to another and, and anatomical information that you got have from one, from one mesh to another and so on? And a lot of inverse mm. problems. So, I mean, it's a, it's a very vast domain of research for applied mathematics. And I, if I can, I'll spend some time on numerics so very fast. So it's yes, a very, sure. you have time. It's a, we have you to have compute stiff waveforms and there are difficulties. So people who are practitioners of computational cardiology, they use, usually they use a P1 or sometimes P2 uh, finite element methods and they use a mesh length this, this size and time step of this size. And we've been working with some colleagues on high order methods in space and in time in order to use well, first we've shown that this, this resolution is not sufficient to have mesh convergence when you solve the bi-domain or monodomain equations. Then we've start, uh, studied high order in space method uh, in order to, uh, to get methods that would use meshes of this uh, resolution and get anyway uh, converged solutions. And then we worked on time stepping methods in order to increase the time step, because these time steps are far too small, uh, to my opinion. So I'll skip the space part. So it's about finite volumes methods, uh, polynomial uh, approximation. There is a theorem. There, are, there is also something on parallel implementation and how it works in parallel. So we can, we can solve these equations in parallel. Uh, study on convergence and accuracy, uh, planar waves, sp spiral waves, in which you see that it's a huge problem when you use, when you use a mesh with a, on top, it's a coarse mesh, but not so coarse, like 200 micrometers. Uh, second order method, you get a spiral wave like that, but when you in increase the order, you get this one, and when you decrease the, the space step, increase the resolution of the mesh, it still changes, so it's completely not converged in this situation. Uh, parallel uh, results for parallel computing. And then time stepping. So time stepping, we go back to the Hodgkin Huxley uh, models, uh, written like, I, like I, I wrote it at the beginning. So you have the gating variables that are semi-linear and the rest is not non-linear. So, the idea is that this is this this completely rewrites us in this setup. So, like a Y is the complete set of unknowns, and it's a semi-linear, and you have a, you keep a non-linear part. You can make that sort of splitting arbitrarily, in fact, since the the, the linear part is in fact semi-linear. There is a, it's a A depending on Y. So it could be arbitrary, but here the nat there is a very natural choice, which is to keep these this, this uh, linear here, 
this, this is semilinear here in the A, and all the rest is going into the B. So it's, it looks like that. So the A is a matrix, uh, but it's a diagonal matrix in our case, and the B contains all the rest. So it works for ionic models because in ionic models, the stiffness is essentially in this time scale here. So there is a bit of stiffness in J and J ion, but the, 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 the largest eigenvalues, if you look at them, are in this, this very small time scales that we have indicating variables. So this is what is nice with ionic models. We can have a semi-linear splitting in which the, the, this A is a diagonal matrix. And why is it nice? Because when you want to run to define exponential in time methods, so this is the ID, but at the end you have the exponential earlier method looks like that. And there is a phi function here. And this phi function has to compute exponential, exponential of A times the time step. So this is delta T, not H. And if A is a complex matrix, then you have a complex exponentials that are difficult to compute, but in our case, they are very simple. So this is why we, we studied exponential methods for uh, ionic models, cardiac ionic models. So, and the rush larsen method is just this exponential Euler method with the splitting A and B that I presented on the previous uh, slide. That's it. But it was written completely independently in, in the 70s. It, it's from 1978. And uh, the formulation of exponential Euler method on the five functions is from uh, Norset and someone from Norset is from 1969. But that's two different communities. Eh? Uh, that's it. And uh, what we did is we proposed two extensions. So the first one is some exponential Adams Bashford. They are complex, hard to implement, but we used the, them to, to extend the proof that existed for exponential methods to the, to the settings that we have here. Uh, and then, then this was done by a PhD student. He had a very good idea, which is to keep, so to make it simpler, to keep the formula of the, the exponential Euler method, but to replace the A and B here, which are just the A and B that you use in the splitting at times N or at times N plus one, N minus one and so on, by some alpha and choose the alpha in such a way that the scheme is higher order. So it means that the alpha are not anymore the, the A, but they are linear combinations or non-linear combination of the A at previous time steps. So it's a multi-step method. The rush larsen number one is the, exactly the the rush larsen method, and at, at order two, you have to combine two time steps to get the alpha that makes this method of order two. You have order three, and order four has been uh, computed also, and you can compute any order. That's it, and it's very useful because it, if you want to run, fine, usually in this um, reaction diffusion equation, you use, you mix, explicit and implicit time stepping to solve the problem. And all the non-linearities, the reaction terms are, are solved explicitly. So if you solve them explicitly with a, fine, with a forward Euler or Runge-Kutta 2 or 4, then for instance, the time step that you need to use must be smaller than one or two microseconds. If you use one of these rush larsen methods that we derived, then it's, it's 100 microseconds. So it means we can compute solutions with very large time steps. Maybe not as accurate as Ronch Kuta, but anyway, with large time steps. And if you look at accuracy, a uh, graph of accuracy in, in, in X and uh, uh, CPU time in, in, on the vertical axis, then you see that all these traditional methods like Crank Nicholson, BDF here, are on top and the exponential Adam pass force or the Roche Larsen are on the bottom. So if you want to reach an error of uh, 1% here, for instance, then the, the Roche Larsen method are far, far, far 
faster than uh, traditional implicit methods. And if you compare to Runchkuta, they are still uh, uh, faster than Runchkuta. Here, this, the, the orange is the Runchkuta 4. Uh, and this is the standard Adam Bash force, for instance. And this is the Roche Larsen, is the red one. And first, it's faster. And you see, the Runchkuta cannot compute large error. It computes with very small time step only. So it gets at the first time step you can compute Runchkuta with, you get very small error. But if you want large time step and you can you can go on with larger errors, which usually you want to do in practice, then you cannot use Runchkuta, you have to use this Roche Larsen method. That's it. So I have finished. Uh, so uh, what to say? So it's, I told you it's a very wide area of research. So I, I, I listed a certain number of uh, directions that you could be interested in in terms of math. I mean, uh, more uh, theoretical math analysis. Then there are many uh, research directions in terms of numerics also, as, as you see, we can, we can still improve a lot all the numerics that we do with these models. There are also many challenges in terms of inverse problems if we stay in, in, in applied mathematics, but but modeling is also a modeling in the sense of uh, understanding new phenomena but after our discussion with biologists, for instance, and trying to implement them into the mathematical models. This is also a wide uh, area of research in which I think we should be interested. And currently, okay, I cannot work in all of these domains by my own, but currently I'm, I'm focusing on three, three main, three, three subjects which are supported by, by three European projects here. So uh, the SIM cardio test project is a project in which we are trying to to simulate the, the behavior of pacemaker in a, in a heart uh, with with a with an industrial partner that is that is a, a designing pacemaker and the idea is to understand the the level of energy that you need to, to place in the pacemaker to 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 start a heartbeat and this is critical because it's uh, related to the duration of the battery that you place. Uh, under the skin of the patient. Um, this personalized AF project is the one from which you saw the, the first video with the, with the heart inside the body. Uh, here we are, try we are trying to, under to solve inverse problems uh, uh, to understand the uh, atrial arrhythmias from body surface uh, potentials like ECGs, but more complex than ECGs. And in the microcap project, we are uh, so. In SIMCARDO test and personalized IF, we are doing a numerical math, uh, but using models that we already have to, to go into applications. Pacemaker here and inverse problems for atrial fibrillation in, in the personalized AF. In the microcard, we are interested in, so the, the video with the, with the cells, the individual cells that we saw like uh, flying over the, the the cell network or inside the cell network uh, from, from the beginning is from the microcard project. Uh, in this one, we are trying to uh, to build a model of the excitation of the heart, but on a cell by cell, cell model. So to describe the geometry of individual cells, their connections, how they are organized in space individually. Uh, so it's more on high performance computing problems and numerical uh, numerical methods that's it and you can go to the you can go back to the to the to the the pool and answer again the question which is let's go to so this is the one we skip okay and this is the the first question, but we'll answer again. And now, now I hope that like I have 100% persons knowing more domain by domain, Hodgkin Huxley and Rothschild. Let's see. 
And afterwards, I'm finished. Hello? Uh, <laughs> so there are still some people who don't know Hodgkin Huxley and Roche Larsen. Definitely. <laughs> so I was not clear. Or some at me, it's fine. Yeah, one of them. I think it's time for questions for those who find some of these unclear. Uh, I, uh, hello, okay. I have a question. It's okay, it's okay for me. I, I keep I keep the pool open so you can still answer if you want. And I'm ready for questions or interactions. So please, uh, if you have any questions, you can either type in the chat box or uh, go ahead and ask. Please, Mazen, go ahead. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Uh, bonjour, Yves. Vous mm. m'entendez? Uh, and then I don't hear you. Ah. Well, I think Eve has a problem with his earphones. You must connect yeah, your earphones. Yeah. Eve. Bonjour. Mm. Can you hear us? Now, um, and please, Mazen, go ahead with your question. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Eve, for uh, this presentation. Uh, I have a question. I, I'm surprised by uh, by the remark that the result of uh, monodomain and bidomain are uh, very close. Uh, it means that uh, the orientation of fibers are not important in the heart, or what? No, they are important, but it, but uh, if you look at the propagation of a wave front, the propagation is uh, the the difference between the propagation velocities mm -hmm. are very small. So if you start from two fronts that are the, you you solve a bidomain and the the monodomain with the harmonic average of the conductivities. You start with the same initial data, a front at the same place. They propagate at the, almost at the same speed. Not exactly, but it's quite accurate. Mm -hmm. There is a small difference, but uh, not large. <laughs> okay. We, uh, and, but if you, but there are things that you cannot do with the, or difficult to do with the monodomain model. If you for the pacemaker thing, if you, you place some electrode on the tissue and uh, you apply a, a voltage, yeah. this, is, this is done in the extracellular media. So the voltage is between two points in the extracellular domain. So you need the bi-domain equation to solve this. You cannot solve this in the monodomain. Okay. And that's, that's what is called the virtual electrode phenomena. Maybe you heard of that. No. Well, I could make a, a complete talk on the virtual electrode phenomena and extracellular stimulation. Ah, OK. Uh, perhaps another question. In the ionic and the gate equations, uh, there is uh, many, many parameters. Mm -hmm. uh, and how do you calibrate uh, this uh, this parameter, and how, how do you get uh, that? Yeah. 
they come from the literature. We expect okay. that the biologists do their job correctly. Okay. Uh, no, it's not. It's not true. So they come from the literature. Mm -hmm. But when 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 we actually built a model for a medical application, like understanding uh, atrial arrhythmias uh, using the model that I I presented, then we adjust the model according to uh, the the hypotheses that are made by the clinicians on the atria. For instance, they assume that there should be uh, uh, oscillating cells in the pulmonary vein, so we adjust parameters so mm -hmm. that the, 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 the cell auto-oscillates. Or, uh, or we adjust the action potential duration because they, they know that in this patient or in this pathology, they know that the action potential in, in I don't know, one, one specific part of the atria is reduced by 50%. So you adjust some of the, some of the coefficients and you know, you know why, they know why, they know that the, the, chan the, I know the, the slow potassium channel, the slow, yes, potassium channel, something is, is not working like, like usual. So you know which one to change. Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, please, if uh, can you either stop sharing or go back to the slides? Yes, I go back to the slide. So, any any questions? Uh, do you still have more questions, Madman? Uh, just uh, for you, you talk about inverse problem for uh, in electrical data. Mm. Yeah. You, uh, it is used uh, measure in the thorax. And wow. the, uh, so the, how 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 are you uh, getting data for for the inverse problem? Yeah. Well, what hmm. uh, how, what is the problem to uh, to be inverse? Ah, <laughs> so there are many questions, but for instance, a very important one currently mm -hmm. is to understand uh, ventricular tachycardia. So in particular, uh, uh, what is called um, uh, no. sudden, cardiac, cardiac, so sudden cardiac death is, is a moment in which the, the activation of the atria becomes chaotic. And in some patients, so some patients go through this syndrome uh, and some, some survive. Uh, and then they go, they go to the hospital and they have the complete checkup with all the, the, the most up-to-date uh, technologies that you can imagine. Uh, ima uh, so very accurate imaging, uh, uh, MRI, MRI uh, CT scan, mm -hmm. very accurate uh, electro, electro uh, ECGs. And their heart is completely normal. There is absolutely no abnormality. There is no pathology, but they had a, a ventricular uh, fibrillation. Mm -hmm. And when you look, well, there is a technique by which you can anyway identify some very small location in the ventricle in which the electrical signal, when you go precisely to this location with a, with a catheter, so by an invasive technique, you, the signal is not normal. It's not like, like it should be. But this region is very small. Mm -hmm. And from on the OCG, you, you can't see it. And so one of the questions is to, 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 know, to we don't know if, we, if we, we really can't see it on the ECGs or if in some sense we, we would be able to detect this region on ECGs. And that's very important because if we can detect such uh, very localized region in which there is a, a defect in the heart, then we can we can prevent uh, sudden cardiac death. You can just you, for instance, you go for a, for an ECG, and with this technique, we say, oh, Mazen, he has a part of his heart with, which is a very small part, but is not normal, mm -hmm. and we have to, to take care that he does not uh, goes for a sudden cardiac death. So it's, it's very important, and that's an inverse problem because we would like from electrocardiograms, or from mm -hmm. non-invasive electrical measurements to find small abnormalities in the cardiac domain. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. 
Well, uh, any other questions from the audience? Let me ask one in the meantime. Uh, well, uh, so uh, you, you said that you're uh, you're trying to uh, to start from models of single cells, you know, single cell simulations, all uh, coordinated together. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't uh, and uh, uh, you know, this is computationally costly, right? So you need uh, supercomputers, you need parallel pro processing pro probably to to, to mm -hmm. do that. What about the the homogenized versions? If you if you start from the single cells and then then you you, mm -hmm. you homogenize your model, yeah. But uh, what is the point the, of? Uh, so the, the the homogenization is exactly it will give you the bidomain equations. That this is well known. Even with yes. the if you have uh, inhomogeneities, for example, and you try to so if you if you have a if you have it depends on the size of the inhomogeneity. If you are looking at inhomogeneity at a scale that is much larger than one cell, then or then you can introduce them into the bidomain equations by uh, modulating the the for instance the electrical conductivity or modulating the the ionic models. But uh, in this uh, sudden cardiac death syndrome that I explained to Mazen before, uh, the, we, we expect very, very small defects at, at the level of just a few cells to be at the origin of, of arrhythmia uh, at the scale of the whole organ. So we need to be able to describe what happens at the cell level. And this is why we go for a such a project to compute the action potential cell by cell. Mm -hmm. It seems, it seems, so there are two reasons. One reason is that it's, it's, it's quite uh, interesting for, for a numerical, uh, for a numer some, someone in numerics like me, because uh, it's need to develop numerical methods to study them to, and so on. So this is, this is nice from, from a personal point of view. But overall, also, it's interesting because we expect, well, it's a, it's a medical assumption that very small defect at the level of cells can induce very large uh, pathologies. Mm -hmm. And we want to understand that. And are there any means to reduce the, the costs? So, for example, using, uh, I don't know, some kind of reduced order models or something like that? Well, yes, but for instance, if you're just interested in the activation, so the, the wavefront, then you can use econal equations mm -hmm. because the time of arrival of the wavefront is, is, is the solution of, the, of an econal equation. But if you want to study uh, how rhythmically the, heart front, the, the wavefront goes, then, and so long term behavior, then you need the uh, the complete model because you need to understand depolarization and repolarization so return to to basic state rest state and uh, and next repolarization and so on it's complex huh? you you cannot yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> what about per personal uh, per personalizing the, the you know, personal analyzed medicine in this context yeah. Uh, so where are we in, <laughs> in this direction? I don't really know. I don't know. Um, we are trying some some things, but I don't think I don't know if it's going to be interesting, relevant, conclusive or not. Uh, that's one of the objectives of this personalized AF. So there is personalized in the title, but it's personalized in the sense that. Uh, we want to provide information to the clinicians uh, per patient for, for a given patient study, uh, get his get uh, electrical measurements and then using a model, uh, give some information to the patients. So that's in some sense personalized. Mm -hmm. But the model, be, so it's, con, it's inverse problems. For instance, uh, uh, the, the cardiologist, the they they use a lot what they call activation maps so that's solu the solution of the econal equation that we talked just before 
it's an activation map, and they can measure activation maps with a invasive uh, invasive system, so a catheter that goes inside the heart. But they would like to have uh, the same maps, but non-invasive. So that that's another inverse problem, for instance, how to reconstruct the activation map from uh, body surface uh, uh, electrical maps. And this is what we do in the personalized AF. Um, So you can personalize the geometry, for instance, because you because you have access to CT scan of the patient yeah. and and you have his own electrical signals. So that's personalized, but the, the microcard is not personalized at all. Yeah. <laughs> and the SIM card the test is not either, it's not the objective. Well, uh any other questions from the audience before we continue? Uh, I have a question, Fatima. I mean, I may have missed it. Uh, please, please go ahead. Did, did you discuss any projects which are uh, uh, involve data-driven approaches to the problems at hand? No, right. I did not. I, okay, so and so, can you comment on the promise of these uh, directions, given the complexity of the physiology? Yes. yes. I think it's it's promising. So there have been uh, attempts in my team, not not by me, but by by colleagues, to to solve these inverse problems. For instance, the to construct the activation maps from electrical signals using uh, using uh, machine learning techniques. Uh, but they rely they re, they first rely on on models because in any case, if we want to reconstruct invasive data from non-invasive data, for instance then we don't have access to non-invasive data. So we need to use uh, computational models to first build databases of such data before we, before we build uh, uh, machine learning models or whatever. Uh, what else? So in, in, if you go to pure uh, signal uh, processing, then uh, there is a, a lot of uh, scientific activity on, on this subject, but this is out of the scope of, of my expertise. So I, I don't really, I can't really comment on that. When you, when you uh, correlate the results of your computations with these approaches, has there been effort in that direction? And do, do, do you find that uh, they intersect in some useful uh, places other than in providing uh, the necessary right. data on which to do mm -hmm. the machine learning. Uh, there has been, I think there has been uh, um, ideas to combine uh, uh, sort of um, Hodgkin Huxley models with uh, machine learning for the propagation and I don't know. I don't know what to think about it. Uh, okay. Thank you very much. Mm. Professor. Uh, yes, go ahead, please. Professor Kudier, this is Dr. Marwan Rifat. I'm a cardiologist uh, at the medical center and I'm a arrhythmia specialist. I'm, I'm also the uh, chairman of the arrhythmia group here in Lebanon. Uh, your work is fascinating, and uh, I do activation map. I mean, all the time when I have lit arrhythmias, mm -hmm. and hope, hopefully later on we can collaborate on some things. I'm I'm doing some research in this field, and uh, hopefully we can discuss more. I mean, okay, with you opportunities yeah. for collaboration. Yeah, it would be nice, a uh, pleasure. Okay. So yeah, contact me afterwards. No problem. Thank you very much. Uh. Any other questions from the audience? Well, I, I can have a look at the book at the at the pool. Ah, nobody yeah. else. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, uh, Eve. Uh, this was a fascinating talk. Uh, thank you very much, and we hope to see you uh, again virtually during the workshop in yes. October. Uh, and uh, very much looking forward to that. Thanks again. Yeah. Thank you, Thank everyone, you for joining. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for the invitation. Good evening, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.